Welcome to the Momentum Lifestyle Project podcast. I'm your host, Dylan Ruse, and here at Momentum, we aim to challenge and champion committed men who are ready to take charge of their lives by mastering their mind, optimizing physical potential, and unlocking their power to find their mission. Whilst our work is predominantly with men, we hope that this podcast will provide value to all who choose to listen. So without further ado, let's jump in. And a huge shout out to our first sponsor here, B Spunky, the Australian men's health brand designed to support you to be the best you can be. Now, Blake Genoa and myself have been using this for quite some time now and absolutely love it. This product is something that we take every single day and drastically improves our training. But the one thing that I've noticed is my recovery time and the way that I feel the next day after training is so much better when I'm taking B Spunky than when I'm not. And it is scientifically formulated to support optimum male hormone levels vital for strength, drive, and overall well-being. So big thanks to B Spunky. You can find the link in the description below. This week, I'm joined by Amelia Phillips, who was the co-founder of the Michelle Bridges 12-week body transformation program. She's a fitness expert on Channel 9 Today Extra, as well as appearing on A Current Affair and The Today Show. She's been in the health and wellness industry for over 22 years, has completed multiple degrees in nutrition and diet, and also launched a podcast series called Healthy Her for mums who are ready to regain control of their body, mind, and life, and has evolved more so into family health. We had a great conversation, and I hope you guys enjoy today's episode. Amelia Phillips, how are you today? Hey, Dylan. So good to chat. It's been a while. It has been a long time since we were on the sunny beaches of Fiji, lapping it up with Nurture Her. It hasn't that oh, right? Oh, my goodness. I have not boogied on the dance floor as hard as we did that night. You pulled out the moves, my friend. I tell you what, <laughs> you're quite flexible for, you know, <laughs> That's, for a big hey, bulky male. Li- <laughs> you know, looks can be deceiving, you know. you got to limber up on the day floor, especially after a couple of uh, champagne. Oh my goodness. I have such fond memories of that night. Hilarious. It was was a lot of fun, wasn't it? I'm looking forward to hopefully getting back to Fiji soon with with that um, retreat company. We'll have to hit the dance floor just as hard once again. Please. Can we? Please. Yes. I'm sure you'll have plenty of energy after, you know, this extended period of no dancing and no clubbing and all that sort of stuff. Oh, I know. Tell me about it. And all it takes is uh, seeing you on the dance floor and that gets uh, that gets anyone up and for you, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, especially the costumes we had. Oh, God. Good, uh, good memories. Good memories. How, yeah. how have you been? How, how has the last 14 months been for you personally? I've been thinking about you a little bit, um, especially in lockdown last year, you know, four, four kids, is that four correct? Kids. Four, four kids. Four kids under seven I had. In Four lockdown, kids under seven. So, yeah. I mean, tell me what that was like. Oh my goodness, the house was such a mess. Uh, you cannot believe how much mess four children can make <laughs> in that house. It was. Um, we had the first two weeks were just diabolical, and then I just realised if we were going to survive lockdown, um, I needed to absolutely overhaul our lack of routine and so I I switched it around and I became quite militant I yes. made the kids put their school uniforms on the two that w- were school aged yep. and I basically set up a routine um to get them out of the house in the morning we'd, we'd go burn off some energy and then we had yep. like a strict homeschooling routine because that was the only way I could um I could kind of you know, face it and get mm. some sense of control in the situation. But look, I have to say we we got through it. There yep. was some great positives that came out of it as well, um, as far as it did bring us closer mm. as a family. Um, my kids learned to stay at home. My, yep. we, we're very active kind of out and about family. I realised like they really can now kind of veg at home without just being on screens. Mm. Um, so we got through it and um, and work was fine because I was able to, you know, as the rest of the world, do everything remotely. But I did miss speaking in public. 
Um, and I, I did miss the, the energy of, you know, a room mm. full of people, that's for sure. I can only imagine. What were the biggest challenges for you? As uh, Was it, you know, I mm. guess, worried about your kids and worried about your kids' mental health and how are they going to deal with it? Or was it more, okay, I need to look after myself first and from that place I can then look after the whole family? Yeah, that's a great question because it it needs to be a little bit of both and that's what I found that first two weeks was kind of all about the kids and I wanted mm. to make sure they were okay and that's why I kind of just let the rules go out the window like yep. guys come on it's pajama day okay you yeah. don't get to see your friends the kids were loving it they were like no school awesome <laughs> um but then I realized that actually I needed to get my own um mm. affairs in order and mm. that came from you know, creating clear boundaries in this mm. new world. Um, and I saw straight away my kids settle into mm. going from kind of crazy, you know, Lord of the Flies style yep. <laughs> um, parenting to, okay, here's the structure that you get at school. And yep. there's a reason why kids like boundaries and structure. Mm. You know, my kids aren't old enough to feel the um, mental health impacts that teenagers and mm. tweens would be going, still going through and, yeah. you know, would, would go through with things like missing school formals, um, having that social interaction, mm. which kind of makes the drudgery of learning at school more bearable. As adults, we pay lip service to that, but we have to recognise that, you know, school life and their social life and, and those events are, are teenagers' worlds, which yeah. all got turned upside down. So yeah. <laughs> I do feel sorry for, mm. um, for teenagers in particular who, mm. you know, who have had to bear the brunt of this big change. Yeah. I mean, I think back to my high school days and they were like the best, you know, some of the best memories, best years of my life, being able to go and um, hang out with my friends every single day. You know, you take it for granted. And once you, once you leave yeah. high school, you're like, oh, wow, I actually got to see my friends every single day in all my I classes know. and hang out. And, you know, I really felt I had a, I had a lot of clients and a lot of um, family friends who were graduating under COVID. And I, and I think for them and I go, geez, like, you know, no, in America, they call it no prom, um, but no yeah. like formal dances, no graduation ceremony, yeah. no, no, you know, big piss up at the pub with all your mates, like mm -hmm. so many ceremonial um, uh, processes. I mean, they, these are once in a lifetime yeah. events. Uh, I, I remember my formals and my graduations as clear as yesterday. And these kids have had them taken away from them. Mm. Like no wonder no yeah. wonder they are struggling. No wonder we've seen a, a massive decline in yeah. age mental health in the last um, 18 months. Absolutely, yeah. And it's such a complicated issue and a complicated um, problem with the last 12 months. And you you can, can't help but think, like, what are the long-term ramifications of those crucial socialising years? As you said, the, I think you said mm. tween, you know, that tween's mm. age mm -hmm. group of where you really do learn to pick up on social cues and socialize and you know you, you learn how to speak with the opposite sex and socialize with them when you're out and about and all these really important um lessons that you learn at that age group mm. and you can't help but go what's this gonna do long term for them how's it gonna you know affect mm. them long term um and it's yeah it's it's really worrisome i guess one thing that's really fascinating about the teen brain is that it is the second largest brain adaptation or neurological mm. adaptation of our brain's life. We have three major events in our life. We have the first three years of our life where yep. there is the most <laughs> synaptic pruning, which mm. means we lose a lot of brain cells, but we specialize our brains to, you know, become the, the toddlers that we become. Yep. Uh, so that's where the brain has the most growth. But then the second largest brain adaptation is the teenage years. Mm. And that is where our brain goes through such a dramatic neurological shift. And that mm -hmm. is preparing us to leave the nest. So, yeah. you know, back in cavemen days or, or you look at, you know, um, mammalian studies, that's when the juveniles are sent out of yeah. their home environment to fend for themselves. And so mm. you have this big hormonal shift we all know about, you know, we, we have um, all the changes that occur. Um, and then the third time in our lives that we have another dramatic 
synaptic pruning is um, is for mothers when they have children. So during the nine months of pregnancy and then the, the nine months after that, that's the third greatest time, which is often forgotten, I might have. Mm. Um, but you this think is information kids, to me. So yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. That's why mums are like baby brain. What is happening? Mm. I don't feel like myself. Um, but getting back to teenagers, you know, teenagers are meant to leave the nest. They are mm. meant to separate a little bit more from parents and go and be more daring and go and experiment and do different things. Um, and they and they haven't kind of been able to do that lately. Mm, um, yeah. And so, you know, it's a really tricky, it's a tricky time in, in, in the best of times, but it's even trickier time during COVID yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. You, you just hit the nail on the head there. It's even in just normal society, it, it's difficult and hard to navigate. And, you know, I, a lot of the work that I do is with that age group and so, um, so little confidence at the moment is is actually the real um, common thread is a lot of, I work with boys, but I'm sure girls are yeah. similar. Like um, the lack of self-confidence at the moment is really like at an all time low. And you see that too That's with, so um, yeah, yeah. And we, we notice it at momentum as well, even with men, thir- you know, 30 and upwards, like confidence yeah. is one of the biggest things that they want to work on and confidence and, who they are and their purpose and what they're, what they're doing and how they're showing up is like one of the biggest things that they want to work on. And I think the last 12 months really rattled and shaked a lot of people who previously were um, pretty confident in who they were and how they showed up, you know, day to day. Yeah. Well, what, it's so interesting to hear you say that. And I really value your input because you're at the forefront at the moment with, you know, boys and, and men and hearing this feedback and that, doesn't surprise me because you know teenagers where where do they get their comfort confidence from they get their confidence from going out and Mm. experimenting and achieving and mastering skill but they also boys at that age the amount of dopamine that is flooding their brain where they are on the hunt dopamine dopamine is the hunting hormone it's the Mm. feel good but it's it's if you imagine that you're shopping for a car and you've got in your mind that you you know you want to get rid of your car and upgrade it and you're online and you see oh my goodness like my dream car and it's in my price range and mm. it just came online an hour ago and that feeling you get that's dopamine mm. that's the hunting feeling and it's um it's addictive and you know, that's what, uh, that's what you get when you play sport and you're, you know, chasing down the ball. Um, teenage boys need a shitload of dopamine. Um, mm. But I'm sure you've heard this through, through the work that you do, um, that when you don't get it out in the real world, then you just get it on your screens. You just get yep. it in the games, you know, yep. when you're playing those video games. So, mm. um that confidence, like you're only going to get a certain level of confidence, you know, being a master of Fortnite. Like you got to get yeah. out there and get the confidence in other yeah. ways, chasing down the girl or. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. And the video game um, developers are really smart. Like the whole purpose of video games is so that they get those dopamine hits that they keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. And I was reading something about you know, the Maslow hierarchy of needs and how that fits in with the video games. You know, you get your base level, your needs satisfied, then you get the next one, you know, and then when you complete the game or you, or yeah, you know, mentioned Fortnite, when you get your victory royale across the screen, you know, it's this big (laughs) flashing thing. And, you know, that's the self-actualization at the top. Cool. I achieved the goal. All right, I'm going again and I'm going again. And that's why we're seeing, you know, boys, boys, girls, you know, people of all ages spending eight hours stuck playing playstation you know I, mm. i've been there i've you know you wake up and you're like all right i'm just gonna jump on for a little bit and then all of a sudden you're like it's dinner time <laughs> where did yeah. where did my sunday go yeah um, yeah how did you uh, keep your sorry you're gone oh no just um to add to that you're, you're so right and um 
the other interesting thing with dopamine is it's addictive as well. So it's similar to sugar mm. it's similar to cocaine. I interviewed yep. David Gillespie on my podcast, Healthy Her, and um, he's written a fascinating book called Teen Brain. Now mm. he's very alarmist. So I had to keep hosing him down during the episode because he was just like, teenagers are doomed. You know, all these issues are like, yeah. well, slow down, mate. But what he was explaining is that you know out in the real world you'll be lucky to get a couple of good dopamine hits a day mm. if you're lucky mm. you know and um and for anyone listening if you've got daughters the the video game equivalent um is social media and likes mm. and yeah, comments. Likes, yeah. so he calls it danger porn and he calls it approval porn um mm. and so with the boys they get these dopamine hits with danger um and that's why video games tend to be yep. you know more popular with the boys although it's you know it's always uh cases on both yep. sides um and then with the girls it's approval porn and so mm. here you are whether you're a girl or a guy and you're danger or approval porn instead of getting two or three dopamine hits in the real world you're getting like 15 to 50 yeah. a yep. day and then what happens is you go out into the real world and you only get your three, like you got one girlfriend come up to you and go, oh, yeah. you look nice today. <laughs> and it's like, is that it? Because I got 150 of those yeah. on my social media posts. So suddenly the real world seems it's really boring. Boring, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, and I'm not sure if you probably did, did you, if you saw The Social Dilemma, that Netflix documentary oh, yeah. that came out. Like, oh, my gosh. It's, um. You know, and with the work that I do with pa with parents, and I'm sure you're similar based off of what you just said with the with Daniel Galepsi. It's like, yeah, it can be it can be scary and it can be like troublesome, but can, you know, I try to look at it as like let's be empowered with this knowledge and mm. how can we take the knowledge? Okay, it's, you know, there's some downsides to video games and social media, whilst there's upsides as well. It's like, okay, how yeah. do we mitigate the downsides? How do we how do we introduce you know, whether it's boundaries or, you know, or yeah, absolutely knowledge and balance. And, yeah. Balance, you know, um, you know, taking away phones or taking away these things are just going to lead, you know, kids to find it elsewhere. And, and, you know, if I can't get it to the video game and I'm a young boy, maybe I'm going to do something more dangerous somewhere else, you know, like risk taking is, is basically in our DNA. Um, yeah, exactly. Mm. And it's interesting. The statistics around, around youth is really interesting since 2010 what has happened which is when smart devices became when yeah. the iphone and um so you know there actually is some really good news that's happened so like since 2010 in teenagers smoking drinking drug taking teen pregnancy they're all declining, yeah. <laughs> which is amazing. So Everyone, you know. everyone's at everyone's at home, just like I know. <laughs> their devices. There's no time for I know, or I know. They're, or they're doing it pregnant. all virtually instead. <laughs> yeah. um, but unfortunately, we do have a growing issue with kids' um, mm. mental health. Suicide is yep. the leading cause of death in. Um, kids under or Australians under 25 um, yeah. and the annual number of Aussies who died by suicide has actually nearly doubled in the last decade so yeah. we're seeing like you know um, serious mental illness um, has risen from 21 to 29 percent mm. in the last so almost 30 percent now have probable they call it probable serious mental illness yeah. um, in the last five years and the main concerns are, are coping with stress Yep. school and study problems and depression anxiety and body image mm. so um you know that's let, that's kicking off the podcast on the sort of these are the negatives but yeah. both you and i are in the coaching world and we want yep. to focus on prevention and yeah. um and what we can do about it um mm. and we're certainly devices aren't going anywhere yeah. so you know what you know my my whole life mission um is about what we can do to support um, the mental health and happiness of both parents and kids mm. because I do believe that prevention is better than cure and there's a lot of great things we can do in our everyday lives to make a massive difference absolutely and before we transition into what we can do how do yeah. you see how do you see two-part question how do you see the parents mm -hmm. mental health decline is has it one has parents mental health been on decline too and and secondly, how much does the um, parenting styles actually impact the kids' mental health? 
So the first part to your question is actually really hard to answer because the amount of research on mothers or fathers or parents' mental health um, post the baby years yeah. is really lacking. And I know this because I did a, I published a study on the impact of mental health, sorry, on the impact of diet quality on the mental health of, um, of pregnant and breastfeeding women. And mm. I wanted to do it of women as well uh, of mums with five and 10 year olds. And I just couldn't find enough data out there. So there's heaps mm. of data around um, mental health of pregnant breastfeeding and, and mums in those early years, but parent parental mental health, yeah, it's probably out mm. there, but um, I can't pull you up a really good mm. statistic, except to say that mental health in general in yeah. the Australian adult population is also on the decline. Do you find when, to put it a different way, do you find when you're stressed, your kids become stressed? Do you find when you're a little bit anxious, your kids become a little bit anxious? Do you find that your yes. mental health is is reflected in your kids? 110%. Mm. And that is, yeah, uh, that is universal. And you would have every parent putting their hand up. Yep. <laughs> going yeah. that they're, Those little people are just a mirror, <laughs> yep. a little mirror of ourselves. And <laughs> yep, they take in a lot more than we would like to yeah. <laughs> actually yeah. acknowledge. So yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting because that's like when um, parents come to me and they talk about issue, you know, issues with their kids. It's, you know, often something that I always think is like, okay, cool. They picked that up from somewhere, you know, mm. where have they picked that up from? And, you know, the, at the, and I'm sure you would agree the best thing, and that's where that balance piece comes into play where you, where you mentioned before around um, looking after your kids, but also looking after yourself and, and balancing the two the two needs, you know, you, cause you've got yourself as a, a mother, you've got yourself as a partner and you've got yourself as a, you know, a woman. Right. And so, you know, you need to kind of fill all, all yeah. three of those cups up yeah. and it's a really tough balancing act. How, yeah. like what, what tips do you have? Um, how do you, how do you manage it? You know, you're one of, you know, the happiest, healthiest mothers with four kids under the age of seven that I've ever met, <laughs> Let, you know, so what are your tips? What are your tricks? Um, you know, how can husbands help them, the, their partners, um, all those sorts of things come into, I think one massive question yeah. and of all the issues for everyone listening, please. Right now. <laughs> oh my goodness. If only it was that easy. And just to caveat that I scream at my kids and um, have absolute parenting fails every single day of the week. So um, I am definitely by no means um, your best practice parent, um, but I do have very good mental health. So I, mm. I am very, you know, I'm grateful for whatever my parents did yep. um, and whatever I've done in my life. I, I, I am definitely, you know, very strong in that area. Just maybe mm. the patience uh, yeah. wanes a little bit at times. Yes. Um, we've, all got, we've all got areas for growth. <sighs> We've all got our limitations. Yep. I mean, how many times does someone have to knock a glass over at the dinner table and spill water everywhere all over the table every single night, please? Anyway. We digress. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, look, this is this is basically the sort of um, the journey that I'm on, and mm. uh, definitely as parents, we want to you know do the oxygen mask theory. We want to look after ourselves first, um, and also recognize that we're not um, that that we don't want to be perfect parents because mm. actually that if even if you are the most perfect parents, then you will raise children that lack resilience because mm. children learn resilience in the home. Um, but I think that if I had to distill down having, you know, in all the work that I've done, there's a couple of things that really stand out to me as, um, as areas that parents can focus on within themselves that I think um, are big game changers. Um, so I think having an organised life makes a massive difference. And I mentioned it earlier when I talked about lockdown um, as a joke, but the families that I see that are organised um, mm. and that have clear routines and rituals 
tend to thrive. Mm. So that would be, and, and and I did a whole episode on this with ch- child psychologists talking about, you know, are you more of like the freestyle parent or, you know, the military um, rigid parent? And I was expecting them to say, oh, you know, it's somewhere in the middle and, 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 and to a degree it was, but they were like children and families need that routine. So mm. that would be one big kind of overarching blanket and that's just mm-hmm. all the little daily habits that you have you know the schedule written up on the yeah. wall the, the um you know the online shopping done um the same day of the week that they order the lunches all mm. that sort of stuff um can you, can you over over schedule and over routinize and and you know i know you're kind of joking with the militant but can you yeah. become the militant like and that you know is there a yeah. they're needing to be a little bit of okay they are kids let yeah. them do their thing or what what's what's it actually look like so uh, in order to raise healthy happy balanced and confident children um this amazing new york times bestseller came up with this model um she called it doing your uh, she, she's basically an organizational expert but she broke it down into uh doing your part Mm -hmm. and looking after yourself and they were two acronyms and uh to answer your question yes you absolutely can over militarize and that's you know the detention center (laughs) you don't want to run your house like that but interest this was another game changer for me listening to her explain it doing your part this is about raising a child there are four elements to raising a healthy happy child um the p stands for provide uh which is put a roof over their head so basically that's you going to work Um, The A stands for arrange and arrange is all the stuff that gets done to make your life work in harmony. So that's booking the holiday camps, um, you know, paying the bills, um, organizing the shopping, all that sort of stuff. And no one ever pays enough lip service to how much time the arranging part happens. Mm. Um, So P-A-R is relate to the kid. And this is where you are in their world. So relating to the child is you have to enter their world. And whether you've got a a toddler, it's about playing, you know, getting down on the floor, playing Lego with them, whether you've got a tween and it's asking them about their video game and what they got up to in their video game. This is entering your child's world and relating to them. If you had a military household, that relate part would probably not exist. And then the (laughs) final part is the T is teach. And this is where you're teaching your child. So, you know, it's it's connecting with your child, but it is in that teach, oh, honey, here's how you tie your shoelaces or no, mm. we don't butter the bread like that or whatever it is. And so she's saying that it's important that we are doing all four of those things. Um, and she goes into a lot of detail about the best ways you can get that organised. Mm. And then just on a very quick side note, the other acronym, looking after yourself, uh, is all the self-care. So that was um, sleep, exercise, love, and fun. Okay, nice. Yep. Yeah. And how does how how much does guilt play a part in parenting? Um, in terms of feeling guilty for looking after yourself, feeling guilty for yelling at a kid and not being the perfect parent. And and I guess, do you see any differences in terms of how guilt shows up in mums versus how it shows up in dads? Uh, Yeah, I think, um, uh, I I don't know if it's a gendered thing, more of a personality-based thing. I I wouldn't, I don't really want to generalise. And because guilt is such a personal personal thing everyone feels it don't get me wrong um and i'm going to say that in certain instances there might be a reason why someone's feeling guilty like they have Mm. done the wrong thing yeah um whether it's screaming at your child or Mm. doing something that you felt was neglectful but the difference is that if if you have done something that you're not proud of yeah um you own up, you apologize and you move on. Honey, yep. I yelled at you this morning for knocking that glass over for the 853rd time. Um, <laughs> I just want to apologize is not how I, it's not how we speak to each other. Yep. And I just want to say sorry for that. Um, <laughs> but so then, ownership is key. Definitely with, with guilt, but I think feeling guilty about 
going out for drinks with mm. your mates um, on a Friday night is not something to feel guilty about. Going out for drinks with your mate on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night in a row and yep. leaving the missus at home. Well, yeah, sorry, yeah. mate. <laughs> Um, Boy, keep that in mind. You can't just go out for drinks every yeah. night of the week. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't feel guilty, your wife will make sure that you exactly. do. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I've, I've no doubt. Yep. Uh, I do think guilt is a, an issue when you start changing your behaviour as a result. Mm. So that's when you, that's when, you know, I talked about routines and consistency yep. and boundaries. If you um, scream at them last night and you were totally militant last night and then and then tonight you let them jump on the couch and behave like loonies because you felt bad about oh, last yeah. night that imbalance Sentence creates uncertain it creates mm. uncertainty and that's what actually can make children feel anxious because they just don't know where, like where is this boundary what yeah. am I supposed to do I don't mm. get it yeah absolutely and you touched on before resilience and i wanted to bring you back to resilience because i i think it's one of it's one of my favorite words and i see it not spoken about a lot um in a general society conversation in terms of just out there in the messaging you know you need to be resilient need to be you know able to go through mm. hard times um why do you think um our mental health has declined so much in kids. And do you think part of that is we're not teaching them to be resilient? Yes. I have a massive bee in my bonnet about resilience. Tell um, me about your bee in oh, your bonnet, Amelia. I want to hear okay. about it. Okay. All right. Well, um, firstly, resilience, it's, it is a word that's thrown around a lot, but easy to say, hard to do. What does it actually mean? Does it mean when your kid falls over you just tell them to get up and don't be a crybaby um the best model i have come across is uh this amazing woman called lynn worsley who's a researcher and she runs a center called the resilience center which has 17 psychologists in it and she's written a book she's written a few books a lot of her books on resilience um one in particular i urge parents to buy is called the resilience donut and I'm going to briefly explain this model to you because mm. I think this is one of the best analogies of how as parents and carers of kids, we can build their resilience. Um, this model is a donut. So I just want you to imagine a yummy donut in front of you. Um, in the middle of the donut are the words, I can, I am, and I have. Um, that's in the hole in the middle. So the hole in the middle is the whole child. This is the, this is the child. Then the, the doughy, yummy, doughy part of the donut is broken up into seven segments. Um, and this model will help, will help you understand how to build resilience in a child. So each of those seven segments of the fleshy part of the donut um, are the factors that either raise resilience or diminish resilience. So I'm going to race through them quickly. Mm -hmm. So good news is the first factor is the parent factor. So parents, you're actually only one seventh of your child's resilience donut. Um, so it, it actually is relieving as a parent to know that, you know, all resilience doesn't fall on you. Parent factor. So for example, I just said, you know, if, if you, if, if you score and they, they ask you to score, you do a little quiz on each of the seven factors yep. to see where your child scores. So a child will score high in the parent factor if they've got straightforward, direct, open, honest communication between parents and child, parents who show warmth and closeness and intimacy with the child, um, but there's also clear parental authority responsibility. So the book mm -hmm. goes into a lot of detail about what, you know, a strong parent factor is. Then you've got mm -hmm. the skill factor. Is this, is this for a certain age group? Is this, this is for anyone, so anyone. it's for adults cool. as well. Yep. So Amazing. if you imagine, like, you could be going, I want you going through this right now. I want you to think of a child yep. that is not sparkling right now. I want you to think of my, someone in, that you know of that's not sparkling for whatever reason that you think is going through a rough time and think of this child as I go through that. The second factor is the skill factor, so the ability to perform basic skills, whatever that skill is, ride a bike, can be any, anything that mm. requires a skill. Yep. Um, but the important thing is this is the strong they'll score well if they have an ability to keep trying that skill despite failing mm, and failing okay. often 
Yep. Third one is family and identity factor. So this is being proud of the family unit outside of your parents. So my uncle is a um, football player. I'm so proud of him. Um, and it's where a child feels um, feels acceptance without the fear of, you know, losing that acceptance. They can be themselves and feel acceptance. Mm. The next one is the education factor. And this is about their school. And it's got nothing to do with their academic score, but it's got everything to do with the child feeling valued as an individual and feeling respected in the school. That's the education. Then there's the peer factor, which is friendship groups. And, and in that chapter, it's all, it talks about how important disagreements and arguments mm. are in the peer factor. You've got the community factor, which is significant others in the community. And then you've got the money factor. Mm. So those seven factors are all what will influence the statement in the middle, which is I can, I am, and I have. Now, mm, Lynn, I love that. Lynn describes that you only need three of those seven factors to be scoring high for a child to feel resilient. Mm. And as a parent, when you do that, you naturally will go, okay, well, my kid's fine in this, this, and this area, but wow, their peer factor is scoring really low. So we're going to focus on peer. She's like, scrap that. She said, what you need, what you need to focus on is those, the three areas that they score the best forget about the rest, well, you know, not, not necessarily forget about them, but focus on the three areas yeah. that they score well and keep building on those because if you focus on the areas they're not scoring well, those statements in the middle of that donut become I cannot, I mm. have not, and I am not. And mm. that's the confidence <laughs> that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. And as a society, we tend to be like, oh, we let's focus on where you're not good at. You're great at maths, but you're not very good at English. So we're just going to drill you on that. But it's yeah. like, mate, but you can skateboard like an absolute pro. Yeah. Um, so let's, I'm going to get you skateboarding lessons. I'm going to take you to watch the skating competitions. Yeah. And that will boister that resilience. Um, mm. And so I really like this. And she, she talks about creating donut moments and um, which is when you've got kind of three things combined in, in one time. Mm. Um, and I just found it a really clear way to, um, for us to understand that resilience comes from so many different areas. Yeah. Um, and we don't need to be perfect in everyone. We just need to find, hone in on what they're good at. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then we build from there. Mm. it's so funny because while you while you're going through that checklist and talking about it it was like resilience is so closely linked to confidence i find like i was thinking about all that and i was like like is this i was kind of like is this resilience or confidence we're talking about here because mm. if you can be resilient you, you're probably going to have a high level of confidence in those well, three it is. you spoke about. Like I can, what was it? I can. Yeah. I can, I am. I am. And I have. I so have. I can, I can ride a bike really yeah. well. I, I can talk mm. in public. Yeah. Um, I have so much support around me because I have, you know, because my peer factor is strong. My, my <laughs> um, you know, family and identity factor is strong. Yeah. Um, I, I have. And she said, what happens is it then spills into other areas. So you've got a yeah. kid that's really good at skateboarding, but hates school and skips school. She's saying what ends up happening is the, the kids, they're so brimming with confidence in their skateboarding, for example, that they will start to go, well, hang on a minute. If I can, if I can do this 360 triple flip, I'm sure I can sit down and read that novel and yeah. write that essay. Yeah. And you, and, it, and then it's just the role of someone else to come in and make that link for them if they're not making it themselves. Yeah. yeah. And the, well, well, that's where the other, in talking to Lynn about resilience, the other major element that I never saw as so important is community and connection. Mm, yeah. And she talks about, um, and it has to be in teenagers outside of the parents because they are, as yeah. we spoke before, neurologically designed to move away from the family unit. That's mm. where you have a teacher that pulls them aside and goes, mate, <laughs> for you in that skateboard part the other day and I saw what you were doing um yeah. I know you can apply yourself to your um Macbeth mm. the way that you were to that 
move that you are learning. And that's where you have those, um, those community connections, mm. which we're lacking in these days where Massively. parents are scared to let their kids develop bonds with other you know, other other adults for right reasons. You hear these horror stories of grooming and whatnot, but there just needs to be a balance, um, mm. you know, where you find those lighthouse adults yeah. um, or older, you know, youth mm. that you feel comfortable with. And I, I remember um, one person described it well. Who are, the, who are the adults that your child might like to invite to their 21st? Mm. That's a good question, yeah. It's a really good. I mean, I've been so grateful that I've had my parents and I being pretty close, have a pretty close relationship anyway. But I've, you know, Peter Christie, like me and Peter Christie will go and have dinner together or go and have coffee or whatever. Um, you know, me and some of dad's mates will, will catch up. We'll go, I'll go into the city to meet them. And, you know, it's really great because, <clears throat> you know, you, it's got that base level of care and, you know, that you can feel from them immediately just because you've got yeah. the family connection. It's like, I know that these people care and look out for me and I can be, be pretty open and honest and communicate with them. And they're going to, you know, be able to, look, you know, answer the questions, be honest with me. And, and you know, some of them challenge in that resilience piece. Some of them are going to challenge you and, and call yeah. you out on your bullshit. And others people are going to, you know, support you and, and care for you when, when you need it. And it's, it's so important. I think we've lost the as you said you know the old the old um quote of it takes a village to raise an idiot you know we've we've really <laughs> stepped away we've really stepped away from that we way have. but i think what's really encouraging about this is um you know to to those listening whether you're a parent or whether you're not you look at it through two eyes those that <laughs> you think about kids in your community that you see on a regular basis for whatever reason, whether you're a volunteer coach, um, whether you just see the same kids in the pickup line, uh, whether you've got nieces, nephews, how can you play that mentor role? Mm. And it does not require a degree and it does not require 15 hours a week. It requires a little DM to, mm. you know, like to, to a little DM with some emojis on it to be like, hey, I heard you played a good game on the weekend. Well done. Yeah. Or, um, you know, just instead of just, hey, mate, you know, like actually connecting a bit more with mm. them and being like, no, hey, like, how are you? Not that you'd ever say that to a teenager, but, yeah. you know, connecting. <laughs> just how can we connect with kids that aren't mm. just our own kids? when they come over and have a, a play date or play video games together, like, hey, just turn it off for five minutes and I want to hear what's happening in your world. Yeah. Because it's, it's, and I'm sure you would have heard this before as I, as I have, um, when you have a person, like a young person come and say, you know, um, no one had ever spoken to me like that before. And suddenly I realized that this person cared about me or mm, they just yeah. said this statement to me and it made me rethink everything. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think know. back, I think a big barrier to people doing that is, and a big barrier in the mental illness and mental health conversation is people are afraid to ask these questions or connect because they're worried that they don't have the answers. And I think what's really important to note is you don't need to have any answers. It's just, you know, I think back again, and I've used this example a hundred times on different podcasts and talking to people in private my best relationship with one of my uncles and one of my aunts was so strong because they just treated me with respect. They treated me as an adult and they just checked in on me. And I would say seven out of 10 times, they didn't have the answers, but they were just like, Hey, Dylan, like that's tough. Sorry to hear that. We're here for you. We love you. You know, what can we do? You know? And mm. it's as simple as that. Even in those small conversations, I think people are really wary to have because they go, what happens if this kid or what happens if this person turns around and goes, oh yeah, actually, blah, 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 blah. What the hell am I meant to say? And mm. it's as simple as not being worried about it. It's just, geez, that's, that's tough, man. I'm sorry you're going through that. Or do you want to talk about it a little bit more? Or is there anything I can do to help or support you? Um, yeah. and simplifying that conversation and not being worried about needing to have the answers. Yeah, that's such such a good point. And also I think a, a lot of 
teenagers aren't necessarily asking you for the answers either. Like mm. it's um, <laughs> if you're going to fix it mode straight away, sometimes it can have that pushback effect. Mm. Um, uh, I'm guilty of doing fix it mode when, you know, my kids will come up to me. My daughter came up to me a little while ago, who's only six. And she said, mommy, I hate my freckles. I think they're ugly. And that just absolutely broke my heart. And my mm. first reaction was to fix it. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Your freckles are divine. Da, 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 da. But actually that's not going to solve anything. You're better off. And I heard one psychologist refer to it as asking curious questions. Yeah. yeah. So just, oh, I'm curious about that. Well, tell me more about mm. that. And you find that if kids are able to talk, then what we're doing is we're taking those horrible dark thoughts they're having and they're having to process them through their frontal lobe. Yeah. They're having to put them into the logical part of their brain and sometimes just the mere transaction of mm. taking that alphabet soup that's in their limbic system that's yeah. firing up all these horrible feelings they pass it through their frontal lobe because you're asking these great, curious, open mm. questions. And then they're like, oh, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe I should just talk to my friend. Maybe she wasn't blocking me. Maybe it was, yeah, oh, okay. Thanks, Dylan. Mm. That was really helpful. And you're like, wow. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> I was just asking questions. Yeah. And and it's a cool communication tool too for, you know, even in within relationships is, you know, do you, do you want a solution or do you want to be heard? Mm. And a simple question like that, whether it is with your child or your partner or your friend, because it's, it's only natural where uncomfortable sitting in other people's pain. And so we want to fix it when in reality off, you know, we need to get better at, at being uncomfortable and better at sitting in other people's pains and sitting in our own pain, of course. And, and asking that simple question of, okay, like, do you, would you like a solution or, or would you just like yeah. to be heard? And a lot of people will just say, actually, I just want to be heard. And then cool. It, you can just yeah. sit there, listen, ask those curious questions, have an amazing conversation. And the other person walks away. You've given zero solutions, but the other person walks away and feels amazing. And I know, you know, as I've gotten older back on the parent son relationship and as I've gotten older and, I've, and as I've become a better communicator, there's times where I just call dad up and I'm like, and I just want to make the blah, 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 blah. And immediately he gives me the solution and I get mm. triggered and I'm like, oh, yeah. all right, bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Cause it just, yeah. you know, it just comes across as like being lectured. And as I've got yeah. older, I've become a better communicator. And that happens. I'm like, mate, I don't want a solution. I just want to talk to you. Like I don't, I don't give me a solution. I just let me rant and rave. I'll figure it out, but I just want to talk to you about it. Oh, isn't that great? Um, and to, yeah. And to be able to have that is again, just so powerful and, and like, you know, really cool. Um, How mature of you to also recognize that too. Oh, well, you know, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm angry. I'm like, fucking, shut, shut up, dad. I'll fucking, you know, and it took me like five of those conversations to go, maybe I'm setting him up for failure here. Maybe I'm yeah. calling him, giving him a problem and he's going, cool, I'll fix, fix it for you. And then I'm getting angry. Hmm, okay, yeah. Maybe, maybe I'm setting him up for failure here. Maybe I'll help the little fella out and not get angry at him. I'm telling him, hey, mate, I don't want a solution. I just want you to listen. When the child becomes a teacher, that's when you know that you've won at parenting. <laughs> Your I, I, dad can now retire. I, I always joke. He's done well. I always joke and say, oh, you know, people will be like, oh, you, you did such a good at, job at raising them and I'll be in the conversation. I'll be like, no, 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 I raised myself. They didn't do anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I raised myself. I'm raising him to be a good parent. <laughs> exactly. I'm raising him, yeah. Oh, but, so do you... Do you have any, I guess, final tips before we do jump off? Um, <clears throat> one for, for parents and, and tips for them to recognise um, maybe the decline in their, in their child's mental health. And then secondly, how, to, how they can best support their child who may be struggling. And I think, you know, again, after the last 12 months we've had, a lot of parents are going to resonate with having children that have been struggling. Um, yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to recognizing mental health, 
in our children and and if it's on the decline as a pet, I can rattle off all the all the telltale signs persistent sadness withdrawing avoiding social interactions um you know hurting self-harm talking about death or suicide but I mean you can google that stuff you know if your child stops sparkling and yeah. I just like to use that word because as a pet, I, I, my husband and I are constantly at bedtime you know we'll jump into bed and we'll go oh gosh Charlotte's cup's full at the moment isn't it you know mm. she's just bubbling with with you know sparkle or or not um so I just guess being really tuned to that um which we are as parents but sometimes we get busy sometimes we're going through our own traumas mm. divorce financial stresses and we haven't really connected so I would urge parents to just make sure have I been having those meaningful connections and mm. am I really tuned in um not being alarmed if our teen or tween um is moving away from us because it's highly normal but yeah. have you helped to facilitate those other mentor role models out yeah. there yeah yeah absolutely um i think having that trust um but also um knowledge of where your child is at all times mm. so they need so particularly in teenagers um it's it's important that they're given that freedom, but it's also important that if your child went missing tomorrow, do you know whose house they were at? Do you have the parent's mm. phone number? Be that really annoying parent that says, I'm sorry, I just, I don't want you going to Kirsty's house and then telling me that you went to Olive's house. I don't know who Olive is and I don't, I just need Olive's parent's phone number and, and give them the freedom and flexibility, but you need to understand that if they disappeared, could you actually trace back to where they were? Mm. Um, asking curious questions so that not fix it. I think that's such an important point mm. as well, being not the fixer, but just the, the listener. Um, and then you know, getting your own affairs in order. So are you, are you doing everything in your own world to make yeah. sure that you're happy <clears throat> and balanced? Because mm. ultimately it, it, all, um, it all knocks on and flows on from you as a parent. So making sure that you're well looked after and mm. having your, your Friday night beers with the boys is a very integral part of that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think too, like with the risk-taking behaviour as parents see their children grow up into teenagers, something that I am re wrestling with a little bit at the moment is what's the line that parents draw with their kids with their kids you know i think back to when i was a, a kid and i was i was pretty fortunate that oh i think you know my parents were pretty fortunate that i didn't really step out of line too much and neither did tyler we and for me for us it was because sport anchored us saturday morning yeah that's where sunday, sport's super important you know saturday morning and sunday morning i had sport and i valued sport so highly that friday night and saturday night i wasn't off acting like a dickhead and if i was mm. off acting like a dickhead i was it was until 10 p.m. and I was at back yeah. home, you know, because I yeah. knew that was that was where I valued um, my time, my energy, even mm. at you know. I think we it's so interesting. We 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 treat kids like kids in some areas, and we treat kids like adults in others. And so, and yeah. a lot of the time, yeah. they actually should be flipped in terms of well, we should be treating you like a kid over here and treating you like an adult over here. And yeah, it, it's really that's a really good point. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and something that I've been yeah wrestling with is is the the like and a parent actually put it to me really well and it was like listen mate like I don't care if you go off and break an arm I care if you go off and break your neck you know it's like mm. you know mm. that's what young men do that we were off doing you know we're off blah, blah, blah. we're learning in the world we're off learning through risk taking etc and it's how do you how do you just make sure okay they break an arm and it's not breaking of the neck and and one thing we're seeing such a rise in I mean, I, well, whether or not it's a rise, but it was so common when I was young and, and mm. still common now is drug taking. You know, I'm not mm. sure what it was like when you were a kid, but, um, you know, you were- Oh you're, yeah, it was only, everywhere. You know, you know, you're only two or three years older than me, I think. Um, is it, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> I love you so much right now. I love you so much. Let's just let's just leave it at that. Okay, you get about a decade in between that. <laughs> what do you have any? Do you have any tips for 
for parents who are either really worried about their kids taking drugs or have come to the realization that my kids might be you know taking drugs and yeah. how can I oh. how can I guide them back I don't feel equipped I, mm-hmm. to answer this because um I am, I'm not a drug and alcohol expert yeah. and I also don't, I, my kids aren't teenagers yet. And it mm. actually, if I'm to be completely honest, it's one of those areas that completely petrifies me from mm. when, um, you know, for, for what I've got coming in front of me with my kids. Um, mm. I, my answer now, it doesn't help the parents of teenagers, but I actually think it starts in infancy as yeah. far as giving ch- children enough rope to be sensible so um and you know it's all that is literally in infancy when a child squeaks when they're a baby and makes a little noise are you going to scoop that child up straight away are you going to leave them for just 10 or 15 seconds to just see if they can sort themselves out Mm. i you know when your toddler falls over do not scoop them up straight away just let them sit in that pain for a moment um because they look to you for your reaction and what this creates is sensible a sensible child yeah. um, and so I'm hoping <laughs> she says that I've done a, I, I give my kids quite a bit of leash so my, yeah. my <laughs> boy who's just eight now is actually a, allowed to ride his bike to school already mm. um, yeah. I'm give, letting him do it t- two days a week which is yeah. a lot of parents would be going oh my goodness but yeah. then there'd be parents who go oh, I'm letting my kid do that at six so yeah um, I feel like that teaching them to be sensible and then you've got those family values that you've just been honing yeah. in, you know, all the, it's, it's that, it's that fundamental. Um, and let's face it, we all took drugs. We all dabbled at some point, but why is it that some kids um, tip over mm. and it's probably those kids that are wanting to, you know, that, that have got some stuff going on. They're not sparking yeah. for whatever reason, but then yeah. that's, that might not be the case either. You might get a kid that's full of sparkle, but they're actually a massive risk taker. And mm. so they've chosen this to be their path. So yeah. I'm sorry, I, I don't want to have like a- No, that's great. Kind of I think that's a good answer. That's a, that's, that's a parental, that, that's me talking yeah. from my heart as a parent rather than mm-hmm. an expert. Yeah, I think it's great, sense. a great answer. Um, and I, th- I look back to when I was a kid and as you said, like everyone was doing it, you know, like there were so many people up, doing it and now that i'm 26 27 90 percent of them are fine 90 percent of them are well being adults doing just fine in their lives Mm. successful um and it's but you do have that 10 percent where you're like geez where you know and i i i agree with you where i think what was going on behind the scenes what was going on when they were younger what was going on when they were in that you know imprint period of zero to seven what they learn in that stages of development that then they carried on and, you know, destructively yeah. carried out when they were older. Um, yeah. I think if you're a parent listening to this podcast right now, you are in that category of mm. your kids are going to be fine. Exactly. Yeah. You know, exactly. like, and I think you don't need to, you know, you don't need to worry too much because uh, I'm you, your kids are going to be fine. You're yeah. doing well. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any final thoughts on parenting that you would like to leave any gems that you've got for us i'm going to put you right on the spot before we jump off oh gosh um no the only thing i'd just say is just delight in your kids you know just remember that if it's all worrying you and you've got all this stuff going on just shovel that aside tell them how beautiful they are remind rub their back remind when they're you know you've had a fight with your kid and you just want to murder them but just Mm. go in rub their back think of a memory and tell them that memory do you remember when you were a kid you you couldn't say l's and you used to say i love you and just sit there (laughs) rub their back tell tell do baby play with them remind them how amazing and special they are um and just get back to that feeling of delighting in them. And if they're surrounded by that delight, geez, they're going to be fine. And so mm. are you. I love that. Amelia, thank you so much for your time today. It has been a great chat. Thank you. My absolute pleasure.